We all know of AMD and Intel. The rivalry has existed for half a century now, and they're basically your only two CPU options if you want any kind of modern computer, but it wasn't always this way. Meet VIA, a computer hardware company that acquired Cyrix in 1999 and produced their own line of x86 processors as a result. This is the VIA C3. Let's take a closer look. What's going on everyone? It's Ozzy from OzTox Hardware. And a couple of months ago, I ordered a VIA CPU and motherboard combo from eBay. Now, I didn't know much about the platform at the time, and my knowledge of computers from the late 20th century to the early 21st century is pretty limited as well. But with the help of my good friend Phil from Phil's Computer Lab, I was able to test out my new toy properly and come to a pretty awesome conclusion about the platform. Now, before we discuss the VIA chip and my benchmark results, a quick explanation of VIA's history as an x86 chip manufacturer is needed. So let's do that first. Cyrix made x86 processors in the 90s. Their initial releases didn't perform or sell well compared to the competition, but their Cyrix 686, which was codenamed the M1, which was released in the mid-90s, was fairly successful and performed pretty well outside of gaming. 3D games started primarily using processor FPUs for perspective correct texturing. Basically, instead of interpolating or guesstimating 3D qualities such as depth on a 2D plane, the computer actually calculates it. Older games did not use this model, so they worked fine with the Cyrix M1, but newer titles like Quake 2, which exclusively used this rendering method, struggled on the Cyrix because of its weak FPUs. A refreshed M2, which was meant to improve the FPU issues on the original, didn't really fix much. By this time, AMD and Intel were making noticeable strides on their processors, so Cyrix went back to the drawing board. After the M2's flop, Cyrix jumped into the mobile department with the first processor with integrated sound and video capabilities, the Media GX. Because of its unique yet practical capabilities and low cost, it sold well. National Semiconductor saw the potential that the uncombated Media GX had in the OEM market and acquired Cyrix in 1997. Cyrix started working on the M3 with the Joshua Core, but financial issues with National Semiconductor and a stronger focus on the Media GX forced the project to end prematurely. Many engineers left the Cyrix department as a result. VIA acquired Cyrix, minus the Media GX department, that was National Semiconductor's baby. They scrapped Cyrix's tech and hired Centaur Technology to develop the new Samuel and Samuel 2 cores and renamed the lineup from Cyrix 3 to just C3. And that's where my VIA CPU from eBay comes in, the C3 1 Giga Pro. It's based on the Samuel 2 architecture with 64 kilobytes of L2 cache and clocked at a blazing fast 650 megahertz. The VIA C3 came with a dinky OEM motherboard that was just a pain, an absolute pain to work with. It's the Mercury KOB 630E, a flex ATX board with two USB ports, a VGA connector, two DRAM slots for a total of one gig of SD RAM, two PCI, yes, no E, slots, and a BIOS software that did not receive any updates according to their website. It included a very small CPU cooler that I feared wouldn't properly cool the processor, but I had no issues there. From what I could find, the C3's thermal design power was in the single digits. Finding drivers was essentially impossible because of the motherboard's age and because of the manufacturer. Mercury isn't very well known, and it wouldn't surprise me if this was your first time even hearing about them. Even their official website didn't have any drivers online anymore. Now, this was a problem, but it definitely was not the biggest problem that I came across. The biggest problem was the expansion slots. There was no AGP. By this time, AGP was the main interface for video cards in 3D gaming. Gaming on a PCI card was still very possible, but because of its bandwidth limitations, it created a bottleneck for video cards and eventually processors. 
I learned the hard way after purchasing the Pentium 3 and a Socket 370 combo on eBay that finding a compatible motherboard for the C3 with an AGP slot isn't easy. Vogons, a retro PC gaming forum, does have a compatible motherboard list for VIA CPUs, but the list doesn't tell you which Marco architecture is compatible with which board, and the boards that users on the forum confirmed worked with the Samuel 2 core architecture started at 100 bucks shipped. That's a bit too much for my taste. Others suggested that I pick up a Slot 1 440BX chipset board that supported the latest iteration of C3 processors with a BIOS update, and a slot kit, a piece of hardware that converted the Slot 1 socket to a more common PGA socket. It's really cool stuff, but the whole setup was still very pricey. So I stuck with my dinky Mercury board. The C3 entered the game when the K62 and the K7, the Athon and Duron from AMD, and the Coppermine and Williamette, the Pentium 3 and 4 from Intel, were established slash establishing in the market. The C3 was also the very first 150 nanometer CPU to ever hit the market, so people were excited to see just how well it performed against the, at the time, 180 nanometer competitors. Phil from Phil's Computer Lab sent me benchmarks using a Pentium 3 clocked at 1 GHz and a GeForce Ti4400. Unfortunately, because it is an AGP card, I couldn't use it in my personal benchmarks with the C3, but he did provide me with the benchmark results and gave me a very easy to follow tutorial on setting up my benchmark suite. So thanks for that, Phil. I really appreciate your contribution. Instead, I picked up a PCI G4 6200 as per Phil's recommendation. I also put that Pentium 3 500E and Socket 370 board I bought from eBay to use as a comparison to the VIA C3. It ran at 500MHz and at an overclocked 1GHz on an Asus Sussel 2C motherboard. Both the C3 and Pentium 3 use 512MB of SD RAM in dual channel, a 20GB IDE hard drive, Windows XP 32-bit SP3, and a G4 6200 with 128MB megabytes of VRAM and NVIDIA 91.28 drivers. A wise guru once said that benchmarks speak a thousand words, so I'm gonna let them do the talking. So as you guys can see, the C3 without sugarcoating anything is it's just awful. It lags behind the Pentium 3 at stock and when overclocked, and it couldn't complete half of the benchmarks in my test suite. Now I won't completely pin this on the CPU. Like I mentioned before, finding drivers for this Mercury board wasn't an easy task and that definitely could have played a role with my benchmark results. But after doing some research and reading up on old reviews of the VIA C3, it looks like my conclusion is pretty similar to what people concluded 15 years ago. It's just not a good CPU. At this time, VIA was shying away from computing performance and moving towards low energy applications like blade servers, for instance. It makes sense, considering the C3 consumes less power than the Pentium 3 500E despite a higher clock speed. Still, a downclocked Pentium 3 or even a Celeron outperforms the C3 while priced identically at the time. Picking up a VIA chip, even for a low power application, was a tough justification. Overall, Cyrix and VIA had some moderate success 20 years ago with their processors, but their technology just couldn't compete with AMD and Intel. The C3 just didn't bode well with most consumers nor OEMs. Cyrix and VIA weren't complete failures though. The M1 forced Intel to release their popular budget lineup of Celeron CPUs, making high-end computing more affordable. They were also the first company to release a 150 nanometer processor, and their Media GX architecture was one of a kind. It was renamed to the Geode, which AMD purchased in 2003, and used the Geode core to produce the world's first low-power x86 compatible processor in 2006. This eventually paved the way for APUs. VIA is still around today, and they are competing in the low power x86 market. And although their chips are expected to come out this year and next year, and they will be a Chinese exclusive, it's still exciting to see what's going to happen, especially with the third competitor in the x86 scene, and exactly how far they've come.
If you guys like this video, then leave a like. And if you loved it, subscribe. Turn on bell notifications so you are notified when new videos come out because I'm just really bad at making videos on time. Also, make sure that you follow me on Twitter for exclusive updates and inside looks on videos. If you guys love me that much, then go check out my Patreon and subscribe there. All that money uh, helps build this channel up. And finally, make sure you join my Discord server. The link is in the description. I'm on there frequently, so you can chat with me and we can discuss anything from computers to cats to, I don't know, Teslas if you want. We'll see. Anyway, I'll see you guys in the next video. Peace.